Hello everyone and welcome back to The War Room, our interview series as part of the Clone Star pod. My name is Sean Ferrick and joining me this week, I feel a little bit spoiled for choice, is the wonderful composing duo from the very recently wrapped season three of Star Trek Picard, the legendary Freddie Wheatman and Stephen Barton. How are you? Very well, thanks. Yeah, really good. Very well. <laughs> like... How does it? How does this feel for you? You are now muzzle is off. We can talk about everything. How like what kind of weight is off your shoulders right now? <laughs> I mean, the literal weight. I mean, the, I mean, the literal weight was uh, six, six, uh, six months. I mean, I think we finished it in uh, September, around August or so. Yeah, yeah August, August, beginning of September. Um, so, so it literally has been six, seven months of, uh, of, 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 of keeping, keeping quiet about it. Uh, and then, uh, but then also I think from the position of being fans of the show as well, and fans of Next Generation and fans from everything that went, went, went before is that, you know, I think there was, there was this, there was, you know, sometimes you're, you're, you're I mean, we were so careful uh, and, and literally in conversation, I have so many conversations of just even, I think for this one, the, like trying to avoid pseudo spoilers, things where you would say something, but it might lead someone to think something. And so mentally unpicking all those pathways in your brain, I think is, 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 is fun. So it's not nice to not have to do that anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been, it's been so long since we finished this and there's such a big anticipation for this season. And I've made it my own policy to stay off Twitter and not say anything about Picard whatsoever. I didn't even announce I was on it until somebody else did. I was just like, not going to say anything and I will not get in trouble. It's that simple. Because just like Stephen said, you might say something ambiguous and somebody will screenshot this, put it on Reddit. And the next thing you know is that the theories are flying through the air and it's <laughs> they're all pointing at you. I think I did that once on another show by accident. I, I thought the release date was public and I hinted at it and it blew up within like minutes and the people called me like hey you gotta take that down i'm like what 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 did i do so, my yeah, biggest, internet's my, not very forgiving my biggest one on this one is the the the, the, the whole enterprise d in episode nine and the, yeah. my problem was is i wanted to say things like this is the coolest set i have ever been on in my life but even the phrase this is the coolest set that kind of yeah. sort of gave it away. Somebody would have so figured that like, out. Yeah, you know, it's been a bit, been tricky, but yeah. <laughs> it, it, I, I can only imagine, like, because obviously, like, the set of the Titan is incredible. I, I love it, but you're kind of thinking, well, we've seen the set in in uh, in trailers, so so is there something? Else? You're right. Everything gets read into. It gets twisted, around. and again, famously calm information sharing sites like Twitter and Reddit <laughs> um, are uh, just you know once it's up, boom, and we're off, and yep. it's either damage control or hide under a rock. Pretty much. <laughs> Uh, so let us, we're going to kind of go back to right the very beginning. I know, start an interview at the beginning. What a crazy idea. Um, so, Stephen, I know you've worked with Terry before, but Freddie, am I right yes. saying this is your first collaboration with Terry Metalis uh, yeah. on this project? So for both of you then, how was that? And then coming together as composers as well, mixing your two styles? I'll let you start, Stephen, because you were the first. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, well... I mean, really fun. I mean, it was actually the, I mean, the, the nice thing with, with, with this is it's something that Terry and I had talked about for a long time and talked about the idea of what, what, what we might do with it. And it's something that had sort of always, you know, I think back from his days on, on Voyager and from Enterprise, uh, you know, he's, he's been someone in the Trek family, uh, uh, the, 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 was always talked about, about us having, you know, so one day they'll give, give him the keys to the car and see what he does with it. Um, uh, and so I think, I think it's something that in his mind has been a, a long, a long time in the making. So. So there's, you know, we we talked a lot about things like Horner and the the the, the all the James Horner stuff and the, the idea of like there's this nauticality that 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 had sort of slipped away from Trek a little bit for a while. Um, not necessarily that, that that was a good or bad thing. I mean, it was just part of part of the whole picture that had sort of maybe been sort of set aside for a little bit, and we thought oh, that would be a really nice thing to explore again. Uh, and uh, there's there's the sort of i think with a lot of it for example when we have the leaving space dock sequence in in in, in episode one it's it is this idea of this there's a bit of the horatio hornblower in it it's a bit of the the, the ships and you know and and harking back to some of the next generation stuff that he and i and, and freddie very much grew up with 
uh, and you know, I literally grew up with it. It's the first show I ever remember watching as a show, not as a kid's show that you got to watch as kids, but like, this is the show that everyone's going to sit down and watch now. Uh, and you know, that isn't just something that sort of talks down to you as, as, as a kid. So that, that for me was very, very important. And, uh, and, and being able to then sort of stitch these ideas together. So we probably talked about it for a good year before it happened. Um, and it was, uh, and, and he, you know, he had this very clear vision from the right from the very, very get go and everything you've seen um and even down to you know i think people are now sort of going you know i'm watching people say like oh why are you using first contact in the end titles and we're like well it's a really good tune and it's also a massive clue but it's a really good tune you know and obviously we couldn't say anything about some of these things so so there, there's there's definitely a nice aspects to that and now people are starting to sort of unpick it and go oh terry had all of that in his mind at the very very beginning like day one minute one so so that that's that was kind of the, the introduction to it really and then uh and then picking up and getting to do it for real and uh uh yeah so yeah, for me it was i mean i came in at the very beautiful spot where steven and terry had set up everything already so i didn't you know i wasn't part in the initial conversations and years leading up to this it was like this is what we've done now <laughs> blend into that <laughs> so it was you know it was um challenging in its own way because you know the obviously this steven and terry's brainchild has been already taken up such a form and then for me to like sort of come in and more later in the game but sort of trying to continue what they've done and add to it uh you know was challenging because everything was set up and i can't just do something completely different so and I, that really I, that really saved the day actually because i mean that was one of those ones where you know we we inherited very much inherited certain things we inherited a, a schedule and inherited a budget and inherited some ways that the, the things were done and we ultimately weren't doing that we were making something else yeah um, and bigger. And, you know, and it's, and, and you just even look at the episode lengths, you know, like the, there's, the, I think it's season two, there's an episode that's 38, 39 minutes, you know, our longest one, which you've just seen is 60 something. Um, and wall to wall it, music. It's just <laughs> massive. And it's, you know, I, th I think that was the other, the, 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 the big challenge is Terry and I at the outset had said, we want to, we want to score this with every bit of the love as you would put into a movie. So what usually happens on television is, is you write a bunch of music and by about episode four or five, the music editor chops some stuff around and covers a lot of the ground for you. And so you might have some episodes in the middle that sort of, you don't need to write very much music for. We said at the very beginning, we don't want to do this. We want to actually score this the way you would, if you put up a movie and a motion picture where every single moment is loved, nowhere, nowhere is, the no unloved child and also yeah. you know you look at the writing and that's the way it is it's not this isn't an episode where there's a sort of episode six fetch and carry little side quest this is is this one big arc and you know if we don't do this it's gonna it's gonna feel wrong or disrespectful almost to 30 something years of of of, of a story and that means so much to so many people so so that but the problem was is that meant we had to end up writing seven hours of music and you know after th two and a half months i was literally dead i mean terry literally was like kind of he was like please don't crash your car in the morning and please you know please don't die and like are you okay and you know they could they were doing everything they could to bring me food but i mean there were only so many hours in the day and so yeah. it became a choice of do you compromise the vision or do you, or do we look at bringing someone else on? And Freddie, we looked. Drew Nichols pulled up the, the the temp track of episode seven, and it was wall to wall Freddie's music. And mercifully, mercifully, he was free. Um, so we were able to kind of go in and really say, "Look, can 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 you help us put this puzzle together? Um, this insane puzzle." And I think Freddie came and was like, "Like, like, what the hell are you try guys trying to do here? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you're a, out of your minds." But the parameters the, that were given yeah. to me was like, "Ah." Uh, really this is what we're doing okay <laughs> close my eyes and go yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was i mean you know as crazy as the whole experience was coming in at that part of the process it was you know an amazing <laughs> experience nonetheless you know incredibly rewarding top to bottom as crazy as it was it's wouldn't want to miss it for the world 
That is absolutely incredible. And I think even before, so I know the soundtrack is dropping relatively soon, but even Any before that, yeah, we've <laughs> had teased tracks and people crying for a release. Um, in fact, one of the questions I was going to ask is, I just saw that there was, was there a discussion at some point of doing episode by episode releases? Um, I know that, yeah. I know we couldn't drop the whole thing in the beginning because I think there's basically like episodes like, and then, or t- track titles like, and here's Jack as a Borg, you know, things like that. Well, yeah. you know, we did, we did. I mean, we all talked about the the Qui Gon's Noble End thing, uh, and it's a you know, it's a, it's a it's a famous one, and 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 you know, Fred. I mean, this is one of one of the nice things where we can talk about it together now, because Freddie's had cues where he can't even see, you know, even though that I mean, there were major musical spoilers in the in the music. So so yeah, we 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 talked about the split thing, but then because it's recorded Union in Los Angeles, there there are certain rules about how you can and can't release soundtracks due due to sort of archaic you know kind of ways that that that's set up so so it basically became a thing as we had to release it all in one go and then we were sat there going how many people are going to twig that that's the jerry goldsmith borg theme and you know what does that mean and are people then going to yeah and dissect and uh, i think that was the point at which we were like we've got to hold this back um it just is too too big a spoiler and, and a lot of um freddie's uh stuff in episode nine i, I think I think you could guess it if, if yeah. we played it. So to yeah. me, and yeah. I had this experience with James Bond where the soundtrack spoiled the movie for me, the last one, because I was, it came out way before the movie and I'm listening to it in mm-hmm. my car and I'm like thinking this song is so sad. Dead. Someone's dying. <laughs> and then it says the ascent. I'm like, oh shit, he's going to die. Thanks Hans. And I, I, no, my, my wife already had Googled the ending. So she knew I would text her like, Hey, does he die at the end? And she's like, yeah, <laughs> like, fuck that's, Anyway, so we we wanted to avoid that because um, you know, you've you've enjoyed the ride and not knowing what happens, and then when it comes, you're like, wow, this is great. So you know, there's enough. I'm a big sucker for unspoiled movie experiences. My wife is complete opposite. She'll Google the ending before we go see the movie, and she'll be much happier knowing what's going on. I am the opposite. I can't know, and hopefully, most people feel the same. <laughs> That's so funny. I would be very much on the same train as yourself. And yet I have yeah. very, very good friends of mine who are completely like, much more like your wife and they love yeah. knowing, you know, like, okay, because they, they need to I think know. They, <laughs> and they look forward to it then. And I yeah. can understand that even if yeah. this is not my approach, I can yeah. understand that. Yeah. To me, um, it's part of the fun, like sitting there not knowing and then, <gasps> wow, like it, it's part of the experience, you know, the surprise. For sure. I mean, there was some moments this season. I mean, if they had been spoiled in advance, uh, I would have, uh, like, right there, uh, Stephen, I, me- I messaged you back around episode six, um, and, you know, there was, the, you know, that musical kind of sequence of we go from, what, DS9 into the original series, into Voyager, into Leonard Rosenman? <laughs> yeah. Is that the bass <laughs> drum cue? Yeah, the 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 the, 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 the Fleet Museum cube. Fleet Museum, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just after the Nation cube. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. It's it's literally, you know, and, and that one was one of those ones where, you know, Terry at one point was like, I think right about when when we actually recorded it, or the, I think it was the first time I played it to him actually, uh, where I sort of had worked through it and it was very much sort of mapped out. That's we knew what we were going to do with it. I mean, what that was, what was fun about like a lot of those sequences was that because Terry had this mapped out in his head, there's no, no there were no major sort of rethinks in the sense of like it was just you know painting it in to this this glorious map and then being able to just work 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 it to be the best you could possibly make it so so actually in that that sense it was quite an easy process um to 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 write in an odd sort of way because you know sometimes you go into a show and no one really knows what they want it to be or well, there's five different opinions of what they want it to yeah. be um and there's you know producers galore and then you know the studio get their paws on it and you have to redo a bunch of stuff and, <clears throat> and then everyone does it again and then and then everyone navel gazes for a while and it's you know it's miserable that can be a miserable process done yeah. done done wrong but when you have someone like terry at the helm that just means you have you know, there's this 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 license to be able to say, okay, we know what we're doing. Let's how can we do it really, really, really well? Um, and so so that that I think was that's what made it made it such a joyous experience. And uh, you know, kind of there's there's 
so much in that sequence uh you know i was able to really look at uh, my favorite thing in that scene is, is jerry ryan's performance thousand percent and and just you know the pause everything down to the timing the pause of when she pulls it up on the screen and you see voyager and you but she pauses before she presses it just for a split second and there's the, and it's all in performance and able to be like okay where we know what's coming we know we 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 know why she's paused for that split second but where you land with the theme and trying different things out i mean all that stuff was the for maximum effect uh was was able to be we were able to play with that so that was great and that is great i mean obviously the fact that you are both professionals and you know what you're doing and this is so how many times do you sit there and you cue a scene and you go we need to give that one another pass the, or did oh, that happen all the time i mean i'm i'm always my worst critic myself um i don't send anything out to anyone unless i'm 100 percent happy with it and it's almost never version one especially when it's in a when it's, when it's very important pivotal moments that you know you will have a lot of scrutiny or will you know will be very music heavy and the music will be exposed versus loud action scenes with lots of explosions where you don't really hear it as as well but yeah that's i'm i mean being self critical i think is really important cuz you can very easily say yeah this is fine good enough mm. and then send it out and then wait for them to give you feedback but i don't know i i i've always operated to my own way to be my own worst critic and it really helps cuz i really still stand by my choices mostly even many years after so i think it's important to be that there is, I think in Picard season three, there is a very interesting and clever balance of themes that we've, like new versions of themes that of course we've heard throughout the legacy of Star Trek and yet new music as well. So as as fantastic as it is to have that template there, to have these original themes, is there also the challenge of how do we balance the two? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and And I think that's one of those things where it, it both goes to speaks to how you uh how you use that original thematic material and the the, the stuff that's um you know gone before and the because because it also goes to this idea of there's 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 just dropping there's the needle drop of like oh we're just gonna play that boom done uh you know uh which doesn't quite it's very tempting uh and they're very powerful devices and powerful things you can use but but uh but it, it not only it, like for example the Voyager theme of like how do you play the Voyager theme and one of the things that I wanted to to go back to was in Voyager I always loved the um the the, the way that a lot of scenes that were very very deep emotionally got very simple with the music the music often came backwards instead of instead of surging up and trying to sort of be be underneath it, it often stepped right back and and often down to just one or two lines so so in that scene there's there's quite a big sur on, on the the you know the uh, uh uh on the enterprise a and then then it, it then it deliberately just steps right back it, it thins right out just two lines um, with the, the voyager theme and then like just just another line underneath it so it's the, the most sort of spare version of it which sort of slightly also harking back to the very final episode of voyager which did that in a couple of spots um uh so so i think it was that it's that thing of like how do you how do you play with the material and we're not just looking at the tune but also how you present it then you've also got the 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 new material and the titan theme and the family theme and uh the dominion theme and we have our new our own little borg motif and so how you how you weave those in i think is very much about ethos it's very much about saying okay well you know we we sometimes boiled it down to what would jerry do or what would james do um and they were both innovators completely across the board so literally if, if a new synth came out one week jerry would probably have it as on a score two weeks later and that, that very first thing in um next gen is you know called d50 and had, had come out you know uh sort of roland d50 had come out i think uh six months or three months before um next gen it was one of the first real uses of it on a major thing so it was that that was very much the sort of you know the um the 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 idea of saying like what would they be doing in this situation and 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 sort of thinking about it from that perspective so yeah and as you know i think have, having the the luxury to really score every single scene without doing any tracking like we said earlier yeah it allows you to just make the whole thing like a fluid experience like you can just do your own thing your own harmonic environment and then bring in one of those themes, the Voyager theme or this, whatever theme you might be using and just 
do hints of it, do parts of it, fragments of it, and just maybe even introduce the harmonies of it without even playing the theme. But it's enough to evoke that. And this way, it doesn't feel so like, here's the theme. Here we go. Cue the Star Trek theme on this part. And, uh, you know, the scene at the end of episode nine is where, for me, that was the biggest challenge is to navigate through all that because it's like a six minute piece of them arriving, going in, and then taking off full of goldsmith. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 I think it being able to do it smoothly and kind of without even really noticing it too much, I think is key to make it a cohesive experience. And then it will blend in nicely with all the original material around it too, which there is a ton of, you know, I mean, we have our own Titan theme, which is basically the main theme for the whole series. Absolutely. And Titan fan over here. Um, but, uh, <laughs> And it is, and it's lovely, and it's fun as well. I think one of the what one of the words I will use to describe the score overall is fun. It is a fun listening experience, um, and of course, like I can't wait for the uh, soundtrack. I I've actually I think I've committed to buying a vinyl player to get the Yay. the soundtrack on vinyl. <laughs> um, so um, from my wallet, goddamn you both. But uh, you know, from, from from my listening experience, thank you both. There's actually there is. Um, but Freddie, you mentioned that scene there, of course, the end of episode nine, where we all lost our absolute shit at this point. And, you know, <laughs> the doors to Hangar Bay 12 open up. Yeah. And th uh, th this is one of those scenes where I think everyone to a certain extent is going to rewatch and rewatch and rewatch. And every time we're going to hear something more because we couldn't hear over our just tears <laughs> the first time. And I think everything was on point there. You had, of course, the performance was wonderful. You had the visuals were wonderful. And I think the most effective score, particularly in those really emotional moments, doesn't kick you over the head. Um, and that is definitely a scene where I think that balance was just perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I think that goes across the entire season three. There are so many amazing performances that you often just as a composer, you're like, how do we not break it? You know, yeah. by going too much because there's they're so perfect in it on its own. You really just have to do a tiny little bit underneath it just just enough to, to let them act because you know it's all there yeah i mean definitely pick, like picard and beverly the you know the first yeah. scene in sick bay where they oh. really go at each other and it's like it's you know some of the toughest sort of like wrenching kind of stuff that they've ever had yeah. um and you know the the music really shuts up for most of that scene it's not in and it's right in at the very end just as it sort of color out the way way out and um you know there's there's there is a lot of music i mean there's definitely a you know it's it's very much sort of cinematic in that sense i mean we're definitely going going for the going going for it but i mean i think that's what terry's musical approach has always been you know the word he's he, his favorite note because it's and it's a dead on absolutely dead on because it's a really it's a good way of asking a composer because i mean very rarely will a director say i want i want you to do this exact you know here's this chord or that chord i mean that, that would be a night probably a nightmare most of the time if they did but um, his his thing is always to ask is like always the music committing to what it's doing, uh, which can be anything from committing to shutting up to committing to starting a cue to committing to being big to being small. And that's I think that's one of the things that's nice about this, because there's 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 been a tendency, I think, in a lot of TV music in the last you know, 10, 15 years to be to be very standoffish and to, to sort of never go there. And you sort of like you deny so much. But the problem is, is that by virtue of that, with this kind of stuff, you 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 need you want the payoff. You you know you don't you can't you can't just hold back and hold back and hold back and hold back every time because it it just gives you a, a sense of that something was missed. Yeah. Um, and so I think that was that was very much with this season what we were trying to do was say like like let's let's look back at why every piece of Star Trek music back in the history of Star Trek music, including all of it, really, and a lot of DS9 and a lot of Voyager. Like, why does it work? You know, why does the end of uh, Best of Both Worlds Part One really work? It's, I mean, that is the most overt bit of music you could possibly have. I mean, it's chung, 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 chung. I mean, it beats you over the head. But you watch, you do you watch it thinking I'm being beaten over the head? Absolutely not. It one thousand percent works because it's earned it. And so I think the idea of saying what has this scene earned? What has the story earned at this point? And, and how do we best deliver that? And then sometimes standing off, but committing to standing off saying, okay, we're, we're going to, we're going to step back and shut up here and that kind of thing. So, so that, and that's, 
that's where you know having a a, a strong showrunner who, who who knows exactly what he wants to make um it just comes in spades because of, because that that's you, you know you can you can you can go at it confidently knowing that you'll be backed up to the hilt by 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 the director so <clears throat> that's great I think a very good example for that is uh, Captain Shaw's backstory when he talks about his um, the Battle of Wolf. You know that his, mm. his performance is so on point, and your score is just perfect underneath it, Stephen. That yeah. you, know, you cry, <laughs> you're fully focused on him, but you kind of you, you, <laughs> really you absolutely capture the gravitas of what the situation he's describing. So I think that was a very and good that- example of subtlety, but really effective and that's a really good example of a cue where terry had a really clear idea he's like he's like i he's like i don't want this to be orchestral i don't want this to be sort of like a saga he's like i almost want it to be sort of like the blown out you know like the yeah that's what it's, it it's, like. it's synth and very sort of like so it's something so 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 you feel the sense of like this happened the, the the time that's passed and how this is dug into into this guy's brain and replaced you know charm with the asshole um and, and i think that's what you know it was really funny watching people online like go oh, i don't like Shaw. Shaw's that you know he's dead naming seven like this guy should just be like committed to the the pits i just kept on sitting there obviously can't say anything but sitting there going you wait till the end yeah. you wait now till they're the all last laughing. thing he does and then the last thing he says by virtue of the you know with with Tuvok and you're just like you're like oh you'll be satisfied with this because it goes completely the opposite way to what you're thinking in um, fact so, I think they're upset yeah. that he's not he's not here anymore oh yeah now they're throwing <laughs> things at it. yeah they're just yeah like, like yeah. what that's our favorite Terry, character Terry has an idea for that there is an idea there is an idea there is a, a well, there really is always idea. the origin story right yeah there's a really good idea and that's the thing I mean that it would, I think well, it would be so so great to sort of make some more of this stuff because it's just he's 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 it, this is I mean he set out with an idea but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have 50 other ideas which he definitely does so yeah for sure of course I mean because this is of course this is the idea that suits this stage of Picard's story there is now through this so many offshoots I mean we are ready for I I can now say this out loud an Enterprise G spin-off. You know, we are ready for a Captain Seven. Um, you know, we have a we now have a crew who we know very well and we want to follow. Or listen, we could go see what's going on in the Fleet Museum. How's Geordie getting on? There's so many different directions that we could take. Um with such a clear idea of you know kind of where where the show was going to go what cues were going to be used maybe not exactly when but still what cues what what beats were going to be hit um and you know there's six and a half hours nearly seven hours of music written what was a wrench to let go for the soundtrack because i presume we're not getting a seven hour soundtrack (laughs) yes well Well there's the funniest story here. I don't know. I'm pretty, pretty can tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go like, ahead. I mean, yeah. It's I like, know. It was one of those things where <laughs> usually nobody deals with composer, you know, dissecting yeah. the music and figuring out what to put on a soundtrack, <laughs> except us composers. But in this case, it was someone. Again, someone usually calls you like weeks after going, "Hey, you need to do a soundtrack." We're like, "Oh, yeah, we're gonna do this." And <laughs> yeah. ten minutes later, just get bang, 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 done. Yeah. And and we got the notice from Lakeshore that we are doing a soundtrack, and I think it took less than twenty four hours, right, Stephen? Yeah, before when, we'd even said, I think we, I think neither of us had even replied responded. to the email. Yeah, we it were was like, like late at okay. night. We got the email. Yeah, we've got we've got time for this. We'll deal with this next week. Too busy right now. Whatever. And then Nine twenty four hours the later, following morning, we got the email from Terry, our showrunner, who had sequenced the entire album for us. Yep. made his choices <laughs> even put the you know edited tracks track together. titles and track the edits. Titles. And he's like, "This is what I'm thinking." We're all like, "Mm-hmm, perfect." We just literally listened to it. I was just like, it was oh my God, it's like, this is really good. And I love the yeah. titles and this is awesome. He'd literally, I think, literally stayed up all night and cut this out. I mean, that's that's the degree to which I keep on saying to people like, and everyone's like, always like, oh yeah, of course a director loves their show. Like, showrunner loves their show. Like what, what else would you expect? I'm like, no, you have no this idea. Like yeah. this is on another level of like you know he literally sat up all night and cut the soundtrack together and probably loved, and it was perfect. It. We didn't change <laughs> anything about it. It's literally yeah. the edit you see on the album is That's the it. edit he spent all night doing. Yeah, and you're just, yeah. No, I mean, you just I've never heard seen or and I've told other showrunners that and they're like other well, people that and they're the directors and they're like, nah, really? And you're like, yep, thousand percent. Did he even his do the vinyl? Yes. Oh, and they did the yeah. vinyl sides. He's like, I think we should do these sides for the, you know, I mean, it's yeah, like the vinyl was even more limited. We had like 20 minutes per 
per side. Per side, and, yeah. Know, we had to do an A, a and B type thing, and it had to make sense, sort of. <laughs> and uh, even that, he was like, "Yeah, I think it should be like this." And we we're all like, yeah. That's good. Uh, you could literally play him any of the cue. You could stop him on the street, give him 10 seconds of any cue, any cue, undoubtedly. And he could tell you which cue it is, which episodes it's in, uh, and, and exactly where it comes from. And the scene, and see, I mean, no, no, without a shadow of doubt, he could still do that on 12 monkeys, actually, to be honest. Like you could play him any piece of 12 monkeys music. He knows it immediately. Yeah. And that's the thing. He, he just has a different connection with music than I think almost any other director I've ever worked with. And I'm including some true. heavy hitters there, like the Ridley Scott's of the world and the, you know, the, that sort of, it's, it's, it's beyond that. It's like a, a love of music and i think also just a an understanding of music that that uh the the sort of you know it, i mean and everyone has this idea of like oh someone sitting in the back of the room who's going like go to a g chord there or something like that and it's not like that at all although he does have great musical suggestions i mean it's very very clued up to it but just has an instinct for how music should work with picture uh when you know we sometimes call it picture sense i mean he just has this mm -hmm this this sense of how to pace things and we're also very lucky we have drew nichols as well who's yeah. the sort of in the, the in the main editing and betty pierce who also um edited uh you know the, the the other episodes uh is similarly very 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 good but drew drew is on another level too of just understand he's a drummer so he understands rhythm okay yeah. brilliantly so you know just pacing and how to work beats up together to to make something to make something that pay, feels correctly paced so i mean without that we would not have managed to write this amount of music yeah. in this amount of time it would be physically yeah. impossible but um, it's like you said so. earlier too like you, when you have a temp track that is that cohesive and detailed and yeah. terry's direction and and guidance to create that and then guidance for us like there, there really is all the room now left for you to just take that and make it better without without having to deal with or you know spend time doing something that you don't really need to do like finding sounds and running it by people and all that stuff. You just go, this is it, make it great. And then you can put all your energy in that. And the results are almost always really good. When you lots of lots that. of the temp wasn't Star Trek as well. So yeah. I think that people might think, oh, they just sort of slap Star Trek music all over the place and we, you know, use bits and you didn't use other bits. I'd say virtually 90 something percent of it wasn't Star Trek at all, was from other places, but just, yeah. you know, with just a really good sensibility for pace. So we could really almost look at the architecture and be like, okay, well, this is working. So what can we do within that architecture? And like that, that, that makes your life so much easier because so many TV shows is just like version one, version two, print it, ship it. <laughs> you know, that's all you have time to do. So, um, and that, I think that was, that was where this vision came in and that's you know and every i think ever in every respect that is i mean it's like the the what they've managed to achieve even visually uh is is insane for the amount of money that they had because it looks it looks like they had five million more five million dollars more per episode than they actually had um but and you can only achieve that when someone is at the helm who knows exactly what they're doing um and 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 then sticks to it and sticks to their guns and doesn't let anyone like say like doesn't let anyone sort of compromise that um so yeah, yeah. was there any anything you disagreed on was there like a theme you were like no this this has to go here or i've or i've written this beautiful theme uh because i'm thinking of um motion picture jerry goldsmith comes in day one and you know robert wise goes yes. there's no theme <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, not really. I mean, there were a couple of spots where it was sort of like, it was about how much of something you did. So, um, and, and almost always, I wouldn't say it was ever really a disagreement because he's almost always right. And you sort of, he's, and because Terry's really good at articulating it, um, that, that, that you kind of know what he's getting at right away. So a really good example is actually, um, in the very first episode and the first time you hear the Titan theme, mm. it sort of gets up to a big sort of climax and we come back into the interior. So you've had the exterior shots, so you come back to the interior. Uh, and he was like, you can take the theme out there. You can drop it out. And so I was, I, I originally had it going all the way through, like played both halves of the, the, you know, all the way from back to front. I mean, you do hear all the theme, but it, it originally kind of played it twice almost, but played it the second time in a different key. And he was like, no, 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 you can, you can drop that out there. Uh, I'm like, really? But it's the first time we're playing it. He's like, no, 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 you're going to get plenty of other opportunities to play this tune. <laughs> like, you don't worry. We're going to hear this thing all season long. So don't sweat it. He's like, but you need to take it out, but still have the chords of it. 
So basically, it's sort of you know, it, it's sort of hinting at Implied. it. They're still playing it, but without playing it. And it was he was like, it's got to clear for dialogue. You've got to clear for this. And you know, there's a couple of sort of um, and it, there was particularly one line where it's like where uh, you know, things like where Seven leans over to Picard and says, you know, quite quite hush, sort of like, well, we don't do anything. You know, the fleet's changed. You don't do anything like that anymore. We don't have to tell them we're going to warp. What says what? You know, nine point nine nine immediately. Um, it's all automated and sort of. So he's like, it, it's often contouring things like that. Where he'll he'll say like okay yes here you here you need to go more here you need to commit here you need to like duck down but in terms of like actual like completely disagreeing on how to do something basically not because i mean it was just here's what here's the mountain yeah. to climb um and and you look at it and you're like there it is and, and you know there was nothing where there was nothing where it was like yeah it's a horrible choice um yeah. you could have shipped the tamp i mean other than the fact there would have been billions in licensing fees from a million other things <laughs> um but it, you could but it worked thousand percent worked as a as a as a as an entity it gave you yeah. the, the right feelings absolutely and yeah i think in my case too there was never a disagreement it was there was a in a few places was trial and error like hey let's try this theme here like the ending of end of seven episode. yeah end of seven was actually yeah. that that was surprisingly smooth i thought i was going to have to write a billion tunes until one is approved and then run with that but i've played him i wrote just the first minute of it gave him the that cello theme and it's like how is this as a starting point and he's like it has potential go and so <laughs> that was it and then i went to do the whole thing but in episode nine the ending when they go to the enterprise there was a there is a version one of my earlier versions where there was a big part in the middle where we played the first contact theme and you know, we while we all liked it, we were like, it's not quite right story wise for this particular moment. So we went back and took it out. You know, we it was a decision we made during spotting is to put it there, and then we re later on realized it's not the right thing. And you just then you go to do something else. That's not really. It's more like trying now, trying mm. something else, and then yep. this works. You know, I wouldn't really call it a disagreement. It's just experimentation. Sure. Actually, I'm 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 glad you brought up the end of episode seven because that track is beautiful right like that is that is a, a hell of an ending to an episode anyway it's like long. everything <laughs> but i mean i the, the first time we watched that it was it was so new to the franchise to have this very paired back very melancholy you know piece of music over this horrific story and you catch yourself yeah. going Am I on the changeling side here? <laughs> do I do I kind of root for Vatican in this scene? Um, and it was it was excellent. It's um, it's one of the pieces I'm waiting for. I, I I played the piano myself. I I will be attempting to learn it as soon as I get the sheet music. So I will butcher that and put it online and tag you. But um, oh. is you know is cello and piano like? Did you know going into that? I was like, right, I'm I wanted I want to bring this style to the episode, or was you, or was it a case of? This just feels right. Well, again, uh, Terry had a very particular idea. He knew, this is exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted this ending to feel a little bit different from everything else that had been leading up to it musically. We even talked about potentially using a, a classical piece from a classical repertoire like Beethoven or something that familiar and then building that into it and making it like a big, you know, Bolero-esque orchestrationally kind of slowly building piece of music. But then we decided to do something original. But it was basically the idea, like, how do we make this this big seven minute quasi classical piece that doesn't really feel like Star Trek music, at least not in the beginning. I think later on it kind of fits in more sonically with what we're doing, but it starts off certainly to in a point where you're like, what is this? Is this a, is this source music or is this a classical piece? What is what am I listening to? And then it slowly becomes what it is, this big you know finale of episode seven. But yeah, it's again, it's all Terry's. Um, brainchild and his concept to end an episode like this and it was just that's very much to find a way to do it <laughs> Ed editorially as well i mean that's yeah. that's one of the things is like he's you know there there are lots of showrunners who you know the editors cut it together they'll watch like the fine cut and be like no oh, cool and have two changes but you know terry very much is like looking at every sequence he was he, he you know he saw most of it be shot even if it wasn't his episodes he was directing he you know had such a clear idea of what the the cut would look like uh and so so something like that you you can't do a scene like that unless it's shot in a very particular way yeah yeah. and edited in a very particular way and so i think that was one of the, the the blessings as well is that 
you had all these things where it was like, let's do this big crazy idea of like, let's have a seven minute classical piece essentially at the to end out this episode. But 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 it wasn't a sort of a hypothetical. Let's try it. You could see that the the, the the structure of it was going to work, and and it tied so nicely into the sort of you know the, the kind of Vadex. You know the the sym the symphony of uh, I mean both from the sense of the you know the the plan that she's constructed, sort of coming together and 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 then also yeah as you say the the sort of the the ambiguity of like well hang on a minute like they are far from blameless it's like this is not the federation life's finest hour and it, and uh, you know it was really interesting sort of seeing people see, seeing some people get quite cross about that who i guess had for, forgotten ds9 maybe and you're like no this is not you know that this is and i think that's that's one of the nice things about this season it's it's it, it's it sort of says it's okay to celebrate all of the great things but then we you know this wouldn't we can't just make this a sort of rah 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 as the federation awesome festival for, for 10 episodes because that would be doing a disservice to so much of what's come before which has you know said so so much about this complex but obviously ultimately noble uh, uh hearted organization like let's let's be let's be realistic about it and i think that 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 was really nice i love that it did that to you um Sean, when you were, like you said, you were kind of second guessing yourself of what, what side you're on, because, you know, every, every villain is the hero in their own story. And we learn about bad expect story in this episode. And yeah, it's like, it's very grim. And you suddenly have a huge amount of understanding for her motivations. And I think that that, that piece of music is helping that quite a bit, to, because up until this point, we've been playing her full on villain, I think, you know, in every scene, she was a threat no no question about it but in this particular scene it kind of tilts it a little bit which makes it, it more interesting it absolutely does that's that's a perfect description because amanda Plummer, who i think i just oh, yeah. hope people Legend. will just, just laud for how great she was this season <laughs> um at, like she was playing it for the back seats you know like she is inhabits every scene she's in and in this incredibly large moment this this simple musical accompaniment and i yeah, I'd, I'm not sure the scene would have worked as well had it been any other way. I think it just, it, it hits every note correctly. Uh, and even then when you have Jean-Luc and Beverly discussing, have we come this far? You know, are are we yeah. going to do that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and can can you sort of set it up a scenario where it's sort of like it says the 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 what will you where will you compromise, and that's a, a real, I think a really interesting question where it's sort of you know uh, the 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 that I think then plays through 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 eight nine and ten I mean really sort of says you know kind of set, sets a new light on it and I, I that that to me I think was really interesting and and, and the sort of thing of like and and I think that's you know what I think. Terry's done really here is it isn't just a matter of you know sort of having the toys in a box and looking at them but it's okay to play with them too being hugely respectful of them but it's okay to play with them too and that's I think is is, is an incredibly important thing for this this particular season where it sort of says like there's there's that 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 very much I think sets the stall out of the tone that he was that he was going for and the, the idea that he was going for with it so um yeah in both like writing for Picard and in general, do you have a preferred instrument you like to use? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a really good one. Well, I think uh, in this particular instance, you know, the backbone of the entire thing is the orchestra. Yeah. Which which is as a, as a whole. As a whole. And it's that's the sound, you know, the Goldsmith sound. We had a couple of people, particularly. I mean, I, you know, there's one particular player who, a guy called Dylan Hart, who's the um, principal horn, I believe, of the the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, and the uh, I think he's still in the I think he's in the LA Phil as well. But um, he's our principal horn player, who's just one of the most brilliant musicians around. Period. I mean, he's one of the finest French horn players ever. Um, and he was someone who was a massive track fan as well. So, you know, it was, it really meant something when he got to play the first contact theme and the Voyager theme and DS9 theme. And so the temptation was always, and actually Terry always really, he's a big fan of French horn. So there was always a temptation of like, actually, that was the Fleet Museum. That was the trickiest bit because we had kept on having these shots. And I kept on being like, well, we can't all be bloody French horn. It's going to be French horn theme, <laughs> French horn theme, French horn theme. You know, it's just going to, I'm like, we have to have a little variation here. Otherwise, this gonna you know this isn't gonna feel like has contours so so yeah but i mean the number of times the like the very end that you know when when they're, they're at the bar before the card game the, you know there's there's the last little snippet of first contact which really then 
sets out what we thought that theme was for us which wasn't this isn't a theme about first contact at all i mean it is it's played in that moment but it, the nicest use of it by far for me and in, in the movie and, and you know we've also we had freaks around to confirm this stuff as well but the the nicest theme is is not used in anything to do with first contact at all it's used in the scene where lily's pointing the phaser at picard and he and it, and it opens the door and there's some other music and then basically the moment at which they really connect and then you know kind of something is bonding over this 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 shared view of earth from space and that's where the theme comes in and it's this this idea of the sort of nostalgia for for what the the, the legacy and that you know that that for me is sort of it's almost like the legacy theme actually that's the sort of theme of like here's the thing we created and so part of our justification i think on the end was like with l the l cars um credits was saying okay well this is about the legacy of of this thing and like we look at we look at this thing and this this and you know l cars means i mean when going on the titan set the first thing everyone does is like they, they boot it up and you know first thing you want to do is press stuff and the <laughs> same same with the same with the enterprise dc i mean the d set they had to like literally be like please don't like press stuff. we have to like shoot this stuff um so so but but that's what you wanted to do you wanted to you know touch it because i mean that was like your childhood that was my childhood and i was like walking onto this piece of my childhood and like going this i can't believe i get to do this and then like <laughs> you just want to press the buttons and lots of them work they do things and they move and you're like this is the coolest thing ever so that viewed from the same sort of thing of like the like here's the legacy and here's that's what that piece means and so that's why at the end you know when it kind of gets you know he's quote you know gets 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 does his does his um you know poetic drive by observation as um, <laughs> seven calls it uh you know there's nothing really fits better than that so but dylan was just amazing on that i mean just nailed that you know two takes and you go you can hear all the other players just be like <gasps> so it's because it's just it's it's part part of part of part of history really beautiful so. Well, speaking of instruments, Stephen, why don't you talk about the blaster beam? Oh yeah, Craig. <laughs> yeah, that's very. It, it was and also Star Trekky. Yes, I mean it was obviously you know to bring back you know someone who was so instrumental in every every part of it, and you know we had a very clear thing with that, which was that we wanted to you know we weren't necessarily trying to sort of give you a Romulan connection or a, 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 a connection. We were trying to be like, okay, this is this is very much sort of using it in as as the as something for the Shrike as part of its sound, but not necessarily sort of full on one hundred percent blaster beam in your face, but um, uh, but but a very sort of um, you know strong flavor that just is just so so part of track track history would have been would have been incredibly rude not to really um and it, you know it was just great fun to work with craig he's just one of the most incredibly nice people you can ever come across really just and, and, and has, has been so connected to i mean he was in it he was in he was an actor as a kid so in, in the show so you know and and there you know anybody he had the shot on his own he's like yeah this is really and he's just like i mean it's an amazing connection to to so to, to everything he's done so that was that was incredible that is outstanding and and you're right, i'm sure everyone watching this will remember but yes he was a very nice young man uh murdered his family but other than that very nice other than man. that we'll forgive yeah, him yeah. that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean like you know come on every everyone gets one i'm talking about in universe you know kind of like I, but um no I, I remember i think that was one of the earliest bit of tidbits about what was coming musically was the the release of like Craig is going to come back. We're going to use the blaster. I think it was yes. one of, again, the good teases of, oh, the I think they're going to do something quite legacy based. I think they're going to, you know, bring, bring some of the earlier. Little did we know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of writing your scores, sorry, I must say, I have a couple of questions here from one of my co-hosts, Mike, who is a bit of a, a music buff himself. Um, so that was Thanks, his question Mike. about favorite instrument. Um, he would like to know, what do you write your scores on? Is it, do you start on a piano? Do you start on guitar? Do you start just on staves on paper? Well, actually, I, a lot of my ideas start on my phone um, in the voice memo thing. I'm like out with my kids and I'm like, oh God. That's oh, you do that too. And I'll oh, be like, I never asked you that. Oh my God. It's there's hundreds and my kids think it's the funniest thing. So they'll go on my phone and just <laughs> listen to them and laugh their butts off because it's like me going, da 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 It's absurd. Makes no sense to anyone except me. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's a lot of actually good tunes have started there. And then I go straight to logic. I don't, I'm not the piano guy. I'm not good enough at playing piano to be composing at pianos. I need my I need I need my daughter to do it. So I'm in logic and you know, I just get started there. 
I have a sort of weird kind of hybrid thing that I do where I, I mean, I do, I'm very much the same where like, uh, I, I'll, you know, have snippets, but I gen- tend, tend to work right into, into the sequencer and into, into, in, into a door and, 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 and working with the sounds mostly because it's it's such great instant gratification and there's no 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 session uh nightmares where you put it up and go i don't think it was going to sound like that Uh-oh. uh and have to fix it that because because god that's happened to all of us there's the stuff you put up and you're just like okay take one oh dear uh let's do another cue while i figure out how to uh to fix, fix that uh but uh you know that's that's you know no matter how long you spend doing this that's always going to happen but um the i think the what my my biggest thing is with this kind of music is just that the, the off, especially if you're doing this sort of leaning into the goldsmith stuff actually Horn, the horner stuff's a little easier because it's a little sort of more pointillist in his thing i mean obviously he sometimes has big massive textures and that's mm. that's a thing but he's often a, a, often a bit more restrained strain with the way he uses orchestra so whereas you look at the goldsmith stuff and it's just everybody's playing the whole time and it's like part of his sound and like when he goes above a forte it's just like tutti bang off you go which is partly why it sounds so good as well because it's just full on uh so sometimes that's the, what i'll tend to do is write it in uh tr- trans start sort of orchestrating it start to get into score tweak some stuff and then maybe either if i can be bothered or i have time tweak the demo and then sometimes the demo i'll sort of play to t- you know with someone like terry that has a good imagination you can play him a demo that doesn't have every single thing in it um doesn't have all the full detail and just be like yep that's going to be a this that's going to be a that and he yeah he can hear his way around that whereas you do get showrunners who cannot have to hear it virtually the exact thing in demo that they they have to the, to to be able to sort of know whether it works for them or not so that's that's just a particular thing with him but um but yeah a, a sort of bouncing back and forwards but mostly like freddie just right into sequence and just sort of trying to trying to figure it out um but but the samples are so good now it's like it isn't even like that that sort of does it in any way a disservice it's like you can write just as complex orchestral music into into a sequencer as you can on paper no 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 doubt about it it's just a matter of time and um, patience and you know and, and then sitting and really having a clear structure of what you want to do are you in um, Cubase Stephen? Uh, yeah, I'm um, Cubase a little bit Cubase Nuendo kind of hybrid. I, I mean, I, oh, wow. I, I've done a lot of not multi-channel stuff, so so I tend to work in Nuendo, but just by virtue of that's what I have installed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's basically the same as Cubase. So, yeah, that was actually and funny. That was my next question. I was like, oh, sorry. You logic. <laughs> and, oh, it's perfect. Yeah, that's absolutely perfect. Um, and Mike also asks, what is your go-to sound library? Oh my god! Ooh, everything. everything. I mean, yeah. It's like, <laughs> I feel like we have. I mean, I, I, at least I buy most of what's coming out. You know, there's there's some old remnants that I still use that are very ancient now, but I still love. <laughs> I can't detach myself from them. But I think I don't know, Spitfire has been doing some amazing work with orchestral percussion, in particular, and also other orchestral instruments. Yeah. That's, so that's I mean that that, that 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 I mean that my backbone is probably uh a lot of the the new Abbey Road um one Abbey Road foundations and the 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 low and high percussion from from Spitfire with that um I'm using a lot of George Strezov stuff um the the strings uh, that he's done uh uh lots of mixtures of woodwinds because woodwinds are really tricky and sometimes one for one phrase doesn't work for another so I'll have quite a lot of woodwinds alternates arranged uh and then then yeah sort of uh a, a kind of big mixture of other stuff um uh, and then there's a lot of you know synthesis stuff like yuhi zebra um omnisphere uh uh some 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 custom stuff i have um samples i've made over the years um uh but yeah just just a, a big mixture and, and and a lot of it's it's a lot easier on this sort of stuff where you know you've got a parameters and you know exactly what what is going in to be replaced so we know for example i don't have to sit there making a flute part sound that good or that realistic i could because i know it's going to get replaced by 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 someone amazing in, in warner brothers so <laughs> that's that's that that does speed you up a lot so uh but uh but certain things you want to like bolster so you know using a lot of the orchestral tools brass stuff and that we often we often we mix just a little bit in with the, the thing just especially on strings just to give it sort of extra extra depth and extra weight and you wouldn't necessarily notice it at all in fact i would be surprised if anyone could but um it just gives it that extra sort of dimension especially when you're in mixing a surround as well because you just want a bit more stuff really to play with 
that is that is super because there's so much of the actual process of putting together a soundtrack that i mean i'm very much a, a layman i love listening to music i don't i don't really know what goes into an awful lot of putting it together so um we always just assumed you just sit down one morning write the whole thing and it's recorded by lunchtime uh so that is that <laughs> is super interesting on that point for both musical layman like myself but also i suppose to everyone watching this now we're going to come up to the end of this uh interview i've got two more questions for you so this no is worries. the second this That's is the great. second to last one now uh this is what would you like people to know about your journey from day one we would like to hire you to do this uh project up until right today and beyond Ready, you want to do uh, that? You, <laughs> so, mean, you mean journey from the beginning of our career to now, or like a new project comes our way, start from that project to the end of it? I, I'm actually going to jump on what you said. I'm going to expand it to if you like anything, anything at all, any story that you would just love people, fans of your music to know. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think Good both question. Stephen and I, we have such a, a love, genuine, like just organic love for movies and the the magic that it comes with it that it's 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 uh we just love what we do and then we get to do it every day which is quite the blessing um but i mean i can convert this question maybe into some advice for uh for filmmakers <laughs> <laughs> um you know it's always good to come in to composers and know what you want but at the same time try to see what they can contribute that you may not have thought of, you know, because we, we have, we, we work in our own little zone here with, with notes and wavelengths and we can manipulate the audience in a certain way. And it's, I, I find filmmaking is always an interesting thing when it becomes very collaborative. And, and I think, you know, it's great to have filmmakers that have, that, that know exactly what they want and then you get them that. And then that's the end of the story. But, you know, for people like Terry, I felt like while given very specific directions, there was plenty of creative freedom to to bring my own sensibilities to it. And those were all very welcome. And I think for us, that's the best canvas to paint on for composers, because you get to do best of both worlds. You know what you're doing, but you're doing it your way and it's being appreciated and it helps the product. And I think that having that little bit of an open mind is extremely crucial for really good collaboration, in my opinion. I think for me, it's the, 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 the ethos behind it. And I think one of the things where sort of, you know, I think that the, the whatever one's viewpoint of where Star Trek's going in the future. And, you know, there's obviously a big crossroads right now about, about the general direction of, of things. And, and that's, and that's great. Cause obviously this, it, what's beautiful, I think, particularly about Star Trek is, is it can be so many things and has been. And you virtually at every time, there's a, ever been a sort of new departure uh a new a new sort of journey starting that there's there's been there's been the the vocal naysayers the the you, know, you can't possibly do it like that uh all the people who are like you know sort of latch onto that and it's the first thing that they've seen and then they go back and go oh i i don't know what this all this old stuff is i don't care about any of that you know and i know people who saw next gen and like watch you know watch uh you know think them think think the original series is kind of sort of pantomime and, and 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 you're like no 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 but maybe not getting the point and it's and then they're like no no but i like i like i like i like the i like discovery i like the i like new stuff and like that's i, I think that's the nice thing about track is that it's been it's been very malleable in a way that i don't think really any franchise any other certainly no sci-fi franchise i think has ever quite explored so much um so for me i think it's it's all about it's all about the ethos of it and it's it, when it's when it works and when it's done well it's usually because you've had someone at the outset say this is this is what i'm trying to do and this is what i'm trying to say and uh and and especially when it's using legacy material like this and using things that, from the past where where it's treated with just a, a huge amount of love uh and that that for me i think is what 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 sort of terry's sort of side of this really represents it's just like is that it, it is that it's okay to go to these places and go to okay to use these 
things and, and 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 play with them and provided you do it with the right the right sort of sensibility and so that for me is just i think that's been a, just a fantastic experience uh and uh, you know just uh, from every single moment on set to every single moment of post you every you know when a good one's being made you all you just know and it's like i've been on believe me i've been on a few that you knew something not so great was being made and you're just like oh right we're gonna finish finish this thing and move on uh that's you know like i mean it happens it's like not everything could be not everything could be tremendous but but everyone knew this one was special you know she and i remember the day they shot um uh the 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 you know when when picard left the bridge sort of saying it's been an honor to serve with you all and you could just you could have heard a pin they didn't even need to call silence on set <laughs> you know no there was nobody going to move a muscle uh not not even for for anything because you're just like you're you're watching every single take because they did it multiple times and you're just like that it's you know there's there's a a thing going on there and so that that for me is like that's that's very special so yeah that is that is beautiful. We're 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 almost done. I want to say thank you so much, both of you, for you're both incredibly generous with your time. Amazing and incredibly interesting answers. It's just been a pleasure talking to both of you. So thank you very much. Um, and for rabbit fans like myself who want to find you online, where's the best place? Oh, I'm on Twitter <laughs> and uh, and Instagram um, publicly. Nothing hidden. So yeah, people can reach out that way. Easily, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of easily found on Twitter usually because, like, just until 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 it gets destroyed or or, or morphs into something else that we, we make make a runner for it. Uh, but yeah, Twitter is usually the best place to find me because we, we, that's the other. You know, I think the other really nice thing is that that you know, especially with Terry and you know, uh, with everybody, really, it's like the, everybody who's made this is we're we're there. We're reading everything, mm. and it's uh, it's 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 been really heartening, and it's you know really interesting as well. You know, sometimes you see a few points where on some episodes where people you know some people didn't like what we did with Sabre, some people didn't like various things and you I, I, the, we read all of it and it's it's uh uh it, it's it's fascinating and i think that's that 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 for me is the the the, the great part of it is that like as a, as a community it's just been a, a pleasure to be able to, to 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 interact and you know especially up to up till now sort of keep silent about things but watch people's reactions and, and experience it uh you know it's just just really great so um and yeah yeah, I just hope hope we we definitely hope we get to do it again or to get to do um one of the one of these many possibilities you know whether it's whether it's star trek legacy whether it's uh you know one of you know because that's not terry's only other idea only idea he's got he's got a whole bunch of things up his sleeve and things that he's you know talking with todd and talking with a couple of people about so um but uh you know we'll see where it goes really um but we'd love to we'd love we'd love to 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 tell more of the story so it'd be wonderful that would be i think uh, hope hopefully you can see um that the demand is there the demand is there so please paramount gods if you're if you're listening and paying attention um you know star trek legacy please final question for you both nice and easy what does star trek mean to you Woof. <laughs> do you want to that one first <laughs> well, I, to me i mean if you say science fiction to me that like star wars and star trek is the first thing that comes to my mind everything else is is very secondary so to me it's the quintessential space adventure in any you know across all the movies and tv shows that have been made to me that it's because i grew up with it perhaps it's something i watched religiously when i was a child in germany because it was on tv all the time but yeah to me it's like it's 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 the starting point of sci-fi discussions this is those two big temples for me you know i think for me it's the it's it's really an extraordinary social barometer it's something that has been part of uh really virtually since color television was invented it was it's been there uh the whole way and so there's it, it, it's it's there, there are things in that that people like things that then that some people may not like um i'm sure there's there's people who threw things at the television you know the first interracial kiss they're like oh, i'm sure that that was vividly vividly angered by that uh and that's it's such an interesting thing that it has been such a part of our collective discourse as a, as a as a as a species really and i think if anything really sort of cements the legacy of gene roddenberry it's like that 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 
ability to 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 be to be a universal sort of touchstone where people can bring either bring people together and uh you know or or or, or bring forward discussion about things and so to be able to be part of that and to be part of such a sort of significant chapter of it in terms of you know what it represents from the last three decades which basically it's been around since i was born uh is is i mean it's, it means an incredible amount uh it's 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 the, the the hugest honor you can imagine that is that is amazing gents thank you both so much uh this has been incredible um to everyone who is both listening and watching along thank you so much for joining us we will of course be back next week with another episode of the war room in the meantime everyone look after yourselves make sure that you live long and prosper and you're all deadly <laughs> <laughs>